Great. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope that you can hear me. We are getting started today uh, with our panel webinar. Um, before uh, we jump into the discussion, uh, a few pieces from me. First off, I should introduce myself. My name's Rachel Whitehead. I'm VP Marketing here at Chartmogul. And I'd like to welcome you to our live panel discussion today, where we're going to be discussing mitigating churn during an economic downturn. Uh, so today is the second of three panels that we're running for SaaS leaders like yourselves before the end of the year. Last month, we talked about investor reporting with a panel of experts, and there's a really good write-up on our blog about that. Um, and then in December, we're going to be covering strategy development for growth stage startups as well. So keep an eye out for that one. But for today, we're focused on everything retention, and I am super happy to be joined by a panel of experts who have really first-hand experience navigating the choppy world of SaaS. Um, and so I thought I'd start off by introducing, uh, firstly, Maria Del Mar, if you can wave. Uh, so Maria joins us um, from, uh, from equity management platform Leggy. Uh, Maria is head of customer experience there. And after raising their Series B um, earlier this year, uh, Maria is now helping uh, the company drive customer success across their customer base. Uh, next up, we have Parker Moore, if you can give a wave, um, who's head of customer success at customer success platform Vitaly. Um, so it's kind of a bit meta, I guess, customer success for customer success. Uh, you can see why we have him on the panel today. Um, so Parker uh, runs CS um, there and brings his experience from previous roles at HubSpot and Eventbrite. Next up, we have Mirana Dufour, VP customer success at social media platform Loomly. Uh, Mirana has helped scale the team there over the past five years and has really helped them create a very tight-knit user community. And then finally, we have Travis Todd, CEO and co-founder of SaaSync. Uh, Travis here is someone that we at Chartmogul are very familiar with um, because his company helps our customers pipe their billing subscription data into our analytics platform. Um, Travis also uh, founded identity resolution platform Full Contact in the past and brings over a decade of experience in growing SaaS businesses. So I think we have a real wealth of experience here on the panel, but kind of to, to prove that, I thought I would ask a sort of quick maths question as we start to warm up. And so quick math question is how many sort of customer interactions, conversations, calls have you had in the last 30 days? And so maybe Parker, uh, first to you, what, what does it look like for you the last 30 days? Yeah, calls, I, I would say like on average, I'm probably like a little bit less than like one a day, uh, but somewhere in that ballpark. I mean, generally our CSMs are great, so I'm not hopping on that, but like once in a while I will. Um, and then I, I have a few customers that I still like meeting with regularly, not really to, to talk vitally, but more just kind of talk CS shop. Um, I'm more active, honestly, like in our in-app messaging. Um, I like kind of, there's a few customers that like, I recall from like early days here. So I always like hopping back in and chat with them. I love that on the front lines, um, chatting, yeah. <laughs> uh, Maria, what does it look like you last 30 days? For me, last three days have actually been really quiet, which is a good thing. <laughs> in my case, I normally only jump in when there is a, you know, major problem and something needs to be escalate it, you know, when, when we need to give that kind of white glove touch and show that we really care about a customer. So we've escalated this to the head of CX. So, you know, touch wood that this doesn't increase in the coming weeks uh, or coming months. So yeah, past 30 days, I'd say like five calls more or less. Makes sense. So for you, it's a good thing. <laughs> when yes, you're not definitely. <laughs> okay, Mirana, what about you? So we're a self-serve platform. So for us, we actually don't do fund support. So no calls in the last 30 days. Uh, we are very active though on our chat and via emails. And uh, I like to be in touch with our customers. So from time to time, I do spend uh, not to talk to specific customers, but just to try to get a sense of what's happening at the moment with some, some of them. Gotcha. Yeah, again, behind the scenes in the chat then as well. And then, so lastly, Travis, what about you? Yeah, just <clears throat> as many as possible. Um, I try to uh, probably get one call a day and then emailing probably much more frequently. So probably five or six uh, folks that I email every day. Awesome. 
So it's interesting, I think here we have lots of contrasts in terms of how you all are engaging with your customers um, and then also your specific roles. Um, maybe a less straightforward question than I thought it was, but still already a little bit of insightful <laughs> insight for me, I think. Um, so for everyone who's joined us, uh, I've prepared some questions that we're going to run through this panel here all around the topic of mitigating churn during an economic downturn. But if you have questions you want to ask or suggest, feel free to post them in the chat and we'll get to those as we go through. Um, but to start off with, I did want to ask about this economic downturn. I know it's horrible to start a panel by talking about something as negative as this, but let's, you know, go through the elephant in the room. Um, for some of us, myself included, uh, you know, wasn't working at a, a SaaS company. I guess SaaS wasn't such a big deal in 2008, 2009. And so really the last kind of economic hiccup, I guess, that that I've experienced was, was during Q2 and 2020, uh, really driven by COVID. And so... My first question to everyone on the panel here is, what are you seeing differently this time around? Um, is your business uh, being affected the same as it was um, in 2020, or is this time different? Um, yeah, sort of how are you experiencing this downturn or whatever we want to call it so far? Um, maybe Maria, do you want to jump in first? Sure. Um, I was thinking about it. So I think for you know, when COVID hit, it was very, very clear that certain industries were going to be a lot more affected than others. Whereas right now, it seems to be more generalized. Um, nobody knowing exactly who is going to be more affected, what are going to be, you know, the consequences also down the line. So specifically for Leji, we are, uh, obviously, a lot of our customers are startups that are dependent on investment. So you know, there's been a lot of talk of people getting more cautious, um, wanting, you know, basically they've, people have changed what they care about mm -hmm. before. It was all about retaining talent and, you know, fighting in the talent world. And now it's all about keeping the, the money in the bank and making sure that every investment you make actually pays off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Parker, how are you experiencing it so far? What are you seeing? Yeah, I, I think back to COVID, I, I think I agree with that. Like it, it was very abrupt, um, I think, where like any nobody really had any idea what would happen. And so we saw like a lot of like organizational wide discounting. I was back at like HubSpot at the time. Uh, but I, I think it was like pretty quick, at least in the SaaS space to um, bounce back, at least like the customers we were working with. Um, and then it very quickly went back to like growth um, at most costs. Um, and now I think, especially at a CSP now, like, a lot of the spotlight is on CS, uh, is on customer facing teams to deliver value and like demonstrate that value throughout like the duration of the customer journey. So then when they come to renewal, when finance is like, hey, why are you spending this? You know, they, they have real clear <laughs> like reasoning for, for as to why they're, they're spending what they're spending. Yeah. Travis, uh, what are you seeing so far? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I'd frame your question slightly different. And how are they similar versus how are they different? Um, and to me, you know, <clears throat> it's like January of 2020 where, you know, or you keep hearing that something's coming. Um, and so it creates uncertainty. And I, so I think it's that uncertainty is how it's similar, um, you know, and it's, it's one of those situations where, well, maybe, maybe actually the downturn will not happen as bad as what a lot of people are saying, or maybe it's worse. Like we, we just don't know. And it's like that uncertainty that just, you know, makes me think of the, how the two two situations are very similar. Yeah, 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 it's a really great point. Marana, what about you? So for us, they are, um, I mean, the two situations are a bit different in the sense that we are a collaboration tool. So during COVID, actually, since a lot of people were working remotely, we actually grew a lot. Uh, a lot of our, we had a lot of new customers, they understood um, why Lumi was, could be a great option for them. Well, now at the moment, I would say to Parker's point, it's more, since people are looking into budgeting, we really need to prove to why uh, it is good. Working remotely is no longer, it's just something that people are starting doing, everybody does that. So we really need to focus on the product adoption and showing uh, why Lumi is so great. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting then. So it is, it is, I guess, quite different from what we experienced two years ago. But 
as Trevor said, the uncertainty is is still there. So in light of that, um, Maria, a uh, question to you, what are some of the improvements that you're focused on right now at Leggy to, to help retention as we go forwards? Basically, it's been talking to customers, understanding what is it that they care about the most and then translating that into our processes. So we're not only focused on, hey, what, what do they care about, what, what brings them value, but also delivering that value in a way that they can understand it and they can actually um, you know, work with it in the sense that you know, we've divided the team. For example, we have the enterprise team working one-on-one -on -one with customers, which is something that big customers really appreciate. But then smaller customers, they prefer to actually do things on their own time because it's more time effective and cost effective for them. So we've adjusted the process to facilitate that. So delivering the value they want in the way that they want it is basically our focus in the next you know, three to six months. Yeah, that's interesting to see you kind of slice up the team to what are the different styles that your customers are wanting to interact with you. Yeah. And I'm guessing for you, Marana, it's probably um, quite different. Uh, you know, your user base is a little different from what Maria's is. And so um, what are some of the things that you're doing over at Loomly um, during this time to drive retention? So since we are a self-service platform, we still want to show our customers how easy it is to self on board on our platform. So we've focused on creating a lot of support resources, different kinds of videos. Uh, we have a YouTube uh, channel that is complete with a lot of short ones, long videos, tutorials, things like that. Um, one key thing at Lumli is that we are very user-centric. Uh, we are working in a very competitive environment. Social media is very competitive. Uh, so we created a very tight feedback loop to make sure that the CS team can actually advocate for uh, what our users want and customers need to do the product team. And our platform is almost exclusively built around the customer feedback. And we try to also be very quick to react to market updates. Mm. Uh, for example, we so we also depend on API since we're working with third parties such as uh, Meta, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And whenever they release something new, we need to be among the first or second one to implement it. So they don't go anywhere else to have that feature. So we rely a lot on uh, the reactivity of our engineering team um, to have those implemented. And since we also, our product, social media involves so quickly, it's hard also to keep, to make sure that customers are always updated, always uh, aware of what's happening on the platform. So we work a lot around product adoption and sending monthly product digest. Uh, we communicate very frequently with our customers. Yeah, so it sounds like in both cases, you're being very proactive and very intentional about how you connect, when you connect, and also about the urgency, I guess, behind that, um, which is really interesting to see how that manifests differently for you know the, the types of customers that you're serving. Um, Maybe a question to you, Parker, since you have a little bit more of an overview on how lots of other different customer success teams are working as well. Um, what are some of the, I guess I know it's cheap to say it, but the low hanging fruits um, that, that some of your customers are focusing on right now in order to stop sort of more immediate or more short term um, churn? Yeah, I, I think our customers are doing a few things. I, I think the first thing is to know, like, there's no shortcuts, but there certainly is like some simple approaches to take to implement. Um, and the first thing to do is look at the past. And by that, I just mean, like, have some type of churn analysis in place to determine like the reasoning for churn. And then with that, you're able to uncover what processes are broken. It also gives you some direction on like what cross functional teams you may need to work with. Um, that maybe it isn't just like a CS problem. It's, you know, a product or like um, a sales positioning problem or something like that. Um, and then in the present, um, depending on, you know, how, how much risk you're dealing with or how much churn you've just experienced, do whatever you can to mitigate churn uh, within the realm of, of what is good for the business. Um, and I think it's also important to note that, like, some of the things that some of our customers may be doing, like, isn't scalable, but like, that's okay, because they're not going to stay here forever. They just need to kind of get through um, this short period of time. And then start to be like very focused on the long term, be strategic and forward looking like the best CS teams will fight to get upstream. And by that, I just mean like they put a focus 
on the customer goals and outcomes. I think when you're in a more like hybrid or, or high touch CS model, well, even in like a, a tech touch model, um, if you're doing things right, you should be able to know like, what are the organizational goals of your customer? You should know how they're going to be measuring success and also like the baseline of where they're starting from so that you can be able to tell a good story there. Uh, and then the last thing is like, know what they actually want to achieve with your product and keep like a really keen eye on quick wins, which, you know, kind of gets into onboarding, but there's a continuous aspect of onboarding, I think as well. Um, so I think every CSM um, should know goals, they should know metrics and they should know how their customer is going to use the product. If they don't right now, like that's okay, but it's not okay to like stay here. So use this time. Now is the time to like start having those conversations. And then ideally like try to document this in a shared place with you and the customer so that you can come back to these things either live or asynchronously. Um, I think doing that creates like a great deal of like collaboration, buy-in and accountability with you and your customers. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a, a lot of sense what you're saying about making sure that the entire CS organization is really clear on why is a customer using our product? What problems are they helping to solve? How are they measuring success? To, because to everything that Maria and Miranda talked about, about making sure that we're really helping meet our customers halfway and make sure that they can actually get the work done they need on the platform. Um, so I love that way of thinking. It, it sounds so simple. Um, it sounds so obvious. Uh, but I know it's much more complex than that, isn't it? Because obviously multiple goals, different customers have different needs and desires, isn't it? Um, Maybe a question kind of tied because we, we have a question from, from the audience um, that is a big one. So I'll throw it out and whoever wants to, to answer can, can give it a go. And so the question is really around, are you seeing differences, whether that's at your own company or, or from the rest of your network, between custom companies that are churning, which are smaller companies versus much larger companies or, or even public companies? Um, basically, is there kind of a difference in who's churning right now, mainly smaller companies, mainly bigger companies? Um, and I think the person who asked the question has a bit, bit of a hypothesis here um, that particularly in larger companies, they may not necessarily need to, you know, cut costs. They may not be trying to save money necessarily, but are sort of like hell bent on achieving that. Um, so uh, anyone, anyone want to jump in on that? Thoughts, thoughts about it? I was just going to say, I don't, I don't think that we've really seen any major changes and maybe yet's yeah, the key word, but uh, I think people are, you know, are tightening their belts and, um, you know, watching where their, where their expenses are going. But it, like, I, I frankly have not seen a, a big, big change yet. Yeah. 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 I think, I think for Lumly, it's, well, you go ahead if you want. No, please, please. <laughs> uh, I, I think for us, it's, it's the same. It's not like we were able to detect specific um, different. I mean, we are more focused for small small and medium businesses, but I would say smaller business were already churning um, due to budgeting in the past. So that hasn't really changed. Now, the only difference I would say is that they are more sensitive to pricing. So we have more complaints around the fact that our pricing are too high, though we did not increase them since, I mean, in a while. So um, I would say they're more sensitive to pricing rather than churning like big ones or smaller ones. We actually have a lot of big ones upgrading right now. So I don't think those ones are directly impacted at the point. Mm -hmm. Maria, did you want to jump in on that as well? Yeah, I think on our side, we have seen a difference. Like when smaller companies, if they're going through a rough patch, they just churn. They're not, they don't reach out and try to cut costs. Or, and whereas with bigger companies, we have had conversations uh, or tough conversations where, you know, companies were cutting down 15% their staff. And then they were like, we need to show that if we're letting people go, we're also making adjustments in terms of software. So we have had to have those conversations um, with bigger companies, whereas smaller companies, they're just like, no, nope. yeah. <laughs> just, uh, just roughly directly saying, no, this is um, like, we need to just cut it. Um, so in that sense, yes, we've seen a difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how, how much that helps. <laughs> I guess it's different depending on the industry as well. Yeah, probably. And it actually, it feeds nicely into another question that we got um, from our attendees here. 
which is uh, a pretty tactical one, but I think one that this group probably has a good point of view on, which is what are our thoughts around, you know, free extensions, temporary extensions, temporary deep discounting um, in order to get those renewals across the line, I guess in particular this quarter and also in Q1 next year. Um, how how do we feel about that, uh, especially knowing that, you know, there's probably a renewal down the line in 12 months once again? You know, from, from my perspective, if you're going to give, you got to figure out how to get. And so I would tie it into pricing and, and maybe that's, you know, moving, trying to move monthly customers to annual, move annual customers to every two years or three years. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you may be giving up some MRR in doing that, but what you're getting is cash flow that's guaranteed now that you can spend wisely over the next several years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Travis. Um, one thing that I'm also making sure to have uh, to introduce in those conversations is value. So like to make sure, yeah, this is not just about price. Like you, companies make budget for things they see value in. So we really go into those conversations to understand, okay, maybe you're going through a rough patch right now, but are we delivering the value that you wanted to see? And if we are not right now, then what could we do in order to deliver the value that you need uh, and be partners throughout, like in a you know long-term perspective? So that it's, as you say, like there's a renewal next year as well. So we need to make sure that, um, yeah, maybe we can help them in this rough patch for the next, I don't know, three months or six months, but are we long-term partners, yes or no? And if right now they don't see us like that, then what does what needs to change for us to become those long-term partners? Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? So we're, I mean, we're different in the sense that we don't really have contracts. So it's very hard. Users can uh, unsubscribe, resubscribe at any time, uh, whenever they want. So we don't really control that. So for us, it's more, how can we, so for example, for uh, discounts, we do offer discounts more as a gamification um, kind of uh, campaign. So we also have, uh, whenever we see that a user could potentially upgrade to a yearly plan, uh, it might be the right time. And also for our business, it's better to have a yearly um, subscriber than a monthly one, uh, it's less risky. So we do sometimes try to incentivize them to actually upgrade to a yearly plan by mm -hmm. offering a discount that will be available for seven days. But this is based on how they are uh, interacting with the platform. Uh, we are not giving discounts like to everybody all the time, but we try to be flexible. Um, and also one thing that we've changed is that, especially during COVID, we started giving discounts that were only available for several months instead of seeing a lifetime discount or so trying to be as specific as we could and also giving that giving them uh, a deadline until when they could actually beneficiate from it. Um, but we do use discounts um, a lot. And since we are also users actually start with a free trial, uh, we make that easy for them to actually just ask an extension. And this is our willingness to accept it either they haven't been back in a long time. Uh, so obviously a lot of things have changed. So we do want them to try again or uh, we their trial ended, but we realized that they did not uh, get the most out of the product. So we do want them to try again. Gotcha. Yeah, so it, <clears throat> it sounds like kind of the approach to extensions, uh, sort of short-term discounts, um, that kind of thing is really focused on making sure that your company is getting something can return. So whether it's uh, confirmation that yes, your product is valuable and long-term we wanna keep using it, um, whether it's a sign off on let's do something, let's lock it in for a year rather than a month to month or even a multi-year contract, um, or if you are offering a discount, sort of put some um, guardrails around that. So it's not a forever discount, but it's for the next few months, then let's have this conversation again. So um, a lot more of a, a conversation, I guess, rather than um, just kind of a, a, a sign away type moment. Um, maybe, you know, kind of getting back to thinking about things that can help us during this time. I'm wondering, Travis, if there are any other sort of silver bullets or any other magic things um, that, that we can focus on right now to help us stop 
more of the kind of short term pains that that some of us are going through. Yeah, I, I, I unfortunately, I don't think there's silver bullets or magic, um, but I think it's like, again, it's a time of uncertainty. So focus on the things that you can control. And um, I, you know, to me, it's like going back to the basics, like, as, as Maria mentioned, people use your product because there is value there. Like there's, there's value to their company in, in using your product. And so, you know, understand that, understand that value proposition. Um, are, are you providing a vitamin or are you providing a painkiller? If you're providing a vitamin, like are there things you can do to your product to move towards being a painkiller? Um, and, and then, you know, I think the next question then, you know, or the next thing to consider then is like, who, who's the buyer in the company um, or who are the users? And um, are, are you actually telling them the value that you provide? Are you providing them ammunition once a week or once a month that allows them to, when, you know, when the CEO comes to them and says, Hey, we're going to chop product X. It's like, well, no, because you know, this, this product is saving us 200 hours a month. You know, that's a, that's a man year. Um, and so it's like not only providing the value, but then communicating the value. Yeah. I think it's a lot of sense. I think it's a, I know I'm a marketing person, so I'm, I'm not the one to, to comment on this, but you know, we're constantly sort of mapping out the different personas, that are the sort of characters that we have on our, on, our, on our account. So, you know, from the buyer to the decision maker to the power users and the champions. Um, and I think it's a really interesting point. Of oftentimes, we'll have people who are, you know, on our account, using it, um, really successful. But as you say, maybe the decision maker or the buyer isn't part of that group. And so are we actually communicating to that person or is it via the end users or via the champions and how can we empower those people more to Parker's earlier point when they have to answer questions around why you're spending X dollars um, on this platform every year or something like that. Um, maybe, you know, then Parker to, to throw it back uh, to you. So let's think about it, you know, zooming out a little bit because so far we've been thinking about short term, what can we do mm -hmm. now? Um, how can we stop this today? Um, but if we zoom out a little bit, bit further, what are some of the ways that that SaaS companies can better predict churn? Um, I know there's a lot of models out there, but I'm interested to know what you all are using. And I guess, Parker, mm -hmm. since you've seen a lot of other CS orgs, how, how they approach it. Yeah, um, I, I think it certainly starts. I mean, part of that is like the churn analysis, but to like go a bit further and really determine like what are the inputs or like the product events or whatever values that uh, are consistent between customers that churn and like your ideal fit customer that really grows with you over time. Um, and so I think where we see customers excel or um, the ones that, that are really able to predict it, they are tracking, I guess, like three different relationships that the customer has. The first is the customer's relationship to their customer organization, like to their CSM or to the customer experience team, whatever it may be. Some inputs for that, you know, obviously like CSAT. Um, how often they're engaging with their CSM, the types of engagements with the CSM, the types of support tickets that are coming in, those types of things. Um, the second relationship that we see getting tracked is the customer's relationship to the product. So, you know, monthly active usership. Um, usually there's like a key persona or a key role that you're selling to. So weekly active usership for that key role. Um, likely your product also has like certain aspects of it that you expect to see the usage go up into the right over time. So tracking if that is actually happening or not. Um, and then the third relationship, which I think is the most important, is the customer's relationship to their own performance. So if we know their goals, we know their KPIs, we know their baseline on where they're starting from, we should be able to see if they are getting closer to or farther away from those things. And so like more tactically, what we do, like for us, um, if any one of those relationships is going into the wrong direction, our health score can catch that with all those different inputs. And then it auto assigns a prescriptive and sequential set of plays to run to address those inputs to kind of better that particular relationship to, to really impact like the overall relationship with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And maybe, you know, to further get some examples of how this might be operationalized in kind of ways of works. Maria, you all are using Vitaly as well, right? Um, so you're, yes. you're Parker's customer right here. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> we're, we're big fans, uh, I have to say. We, we are definitely using almost, you know, to the dot what Parker was mentioning. Uh, I find it, it's obviously super, super key. 
I, I feel I repeat myself a lot, but just like to understand what brings value to your customer and track that and mm. make sure that whatever plays you have, whether it is in onboarding or in adoption, that you configure your customer journey towards that value and towards helping your customers achieve those milestones. And what we like, we've basically set up those plays and those projects to make sure that we understand where our customers are at in their onboarding, adoption and retention journeys and to make sure that we can jump in whenever it is that they're just going off track and make sure to understand why is it, um, what, what went wrong and how can we bring them back basically. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's a great early indicator, isn't it? Um, and nice to be able to dig deeper. M Marana, how does it work for Loomly? What, how are you able to sort of predict or spot this before it becomes a big problem? So we are not using any tool at the moment, but we did a huge, I mean, we do frequently churn analysis every month. Um, and I would say some of the behaviors where someone is more likely to churn is almost always the same for us. Um, it can be either they were not onboarded properly or did not read everything that we sent since we're not in touch with them all the time and they reach out. Uh, we actually try to focus on making sure that we send them um, at the right time, the right guides or the right video. So this is actually, we're working a lot on our, it's an in-app campaigns and life cycle in terms of how we communicate constantly with our customers to make sure that we don't over spam them. We send them the right information whenever they need to. That means obviously receiving that information from um, we're using, I mean, I think I can say it, but we're using Intercom. And we have actually specific attributes that allows us to say if the user did not check that area, did not click there, then let's try to get them here. Uh, we have also guided tours uh, inside our application, which is very useful. And this is actually something that we started doing um, during uh, COVID, we realized that whenever we were doing webinars, uh, people didn't have that much time to spend uh, an hour. I mean, this this webinar is 45 minutes, so I'm sure people have time, but I mean, sometimes it was more like doing a long webinar, talking about different things throughout the platform might not be that interesting for everybody. Uh, so they were not joining. So we decided to do flash webinars, five to 15 minutes, only focusing on one specific feature so we could go in depth just for one feature in that way, we could also leverage those videos for um, our customers. So again, I mean, it's going back to making sure that they get the most out of Loomly product adoption, uh, like Maria mentioned. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I like as well what you mentioned about this like heartbeat of having the monthly churn analysis. I think it's, it's something that we don't always do um, at startups, right? We have kind of our assumptions or there's a few anecdotes that we've heard and um, it's great to hear that you're actually diving deep and looking at doing the the hard work of looking at Excel spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's look to 2023. Um, I guess the question, let's start with you, Maria, is what are some of the things that you're planning on implementing in 2023 to help with, you know, the renewals that are coming Q3, Q4 next year, kind of future retention. Are there any new initiatives or, or things that you're trying to add um, for next year? Definitely. I mean, we're always changing and adapting. Uh, like uh, for, at least for me, it's like if, if you um, stagnate, it's, it's only going to go down from there. So um, things that we're planning to implement next year is um, we're going to do a, a huge um, campaign to kind of recover all of our old customers that seem a bit dormant, make sure that we wake them up, we understand uh, where they are at, um, possibly even, you know, restart their onboarding journeys if some of them were not able to properly onboard. So mm -hmm. that's one that is always kind of scary because you can wake up some, you know, sleeping bears, but in the end, if they're not using the product, they're just bound to churn. So we prefer to know where they are at um, and what can we do to, to improve that. And yeah, we're going to change the structure of our executive business reviews to focus on what our customers care about the most right now, which is basically 
saving time, saving money, saving costs. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that, like we were saying before, they have the necessary uh, ammunition to justify, hey, we still need Legi in our lives. This is a major time saving for the finance team, for the HR team. We really, really do need this. This is not just a, you know, nice to have. Yeah. Not just a vitamin, as Travis put it, but a, a exactly. pain. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And um, we actually have a, another interesting question from um, the audience as well around, uh, again, getting getting a little bit to the negative, but that's okay, um, which is what happens uh, when despite all of our best efforts, it's a goodbye scenario. Um, and so uh, people are interested to hear if you have any smart ideas beyond sort of giving people Amazon vouchers uh, for how to get uh, exiting customers to take part in an exit interviews? Um, is that a, a good approach? You know, how how are you getting that information when you do, for example, your churn analysis? What's the real reason they're leaving? Um, anyone here running a kind of exit interview program or, or something like that? Not, I mean, not like, <laughs> formally um I, I think it just i don't know it, it typically works out that we're able to like a relationship has been established um I, I think for us like we we try to make it really easy uh on them but in some respects but we also want to make it hard in other ways uh easy I, I think what we try to do is like make the offboarding process uh still a good experience it's still part of like the customer journey um, mm -hmm. So we don't want like a barrier necessarily to cancel. We want them to be able to like access, you know, their data, be able to transition and like migrate that. And I think where we try to make it hard is like um, make it hard, to, like sever that relationship with your CSM. Um, the CSM's task is to deliver value for the life of the subscription. And, you know, we've had customers where it's like nine months out, they're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to have to leave. Um, and so we still have a conversation with them where it's like, hey, you're still going to have access between now and then. You've let me know that your goals are X, Y, Z our tool is valuable and it can help you get closer there. You don't have time to waste um, on your goals. Like I understand that you'll still move on, uh, but let's work together to achieve those things. Um, and so that has certainly been beneficial for us where some customers get to that point and they're like, yeah, never mind, I'm, I'm sticking around. Uh, but even if they do, um, they're still hopefully leaving with the sentiment that it's like, boy, I'm, I'm losing an extension of my team here. Um, yeah. And I think internally still do that churn analysis and then also determine if this was like a good fit customer that we really want back. And if it is like, we need to work with sales and marketing um, so that we can like reach back out to them when they're coming back into this like review cycle. Um, and again, we're already equipped with their like goals and KPIs. So we can speak again to like the value that we were able to drive and kind of check in on, on how it's going. Like hopefully they're doing well, but not as well as they were with us. So There's a vitality shaped gap. Um, and their growth rate. Um, no, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, your customers already made one decision to start using your platform, right? Um, and so clearly there was a reason why they ended up your customer in the first place. And so making sure that they're clear on what's the value they're going to miss out on and they can articulate that is really important because, again, sometimes people still have to churn. Um, you know, my decision might be out of their hands or um, especially, as you mentioned, you know, smaller companies where budgets may be a little tight. Um, it is what it is. However, uh, it's good for them to understand and to make sure that you understand what it is they were hoping to get, right? Um, and that's actually another question we have here is around what are the steps that, that you go through? Parker, you kind of outlined a little bit. So when a customer comes to you or they click cancel or unsubscribe, whatever the process is, what are the, some of the steps that you go through in order to sort of offboard that customer um, is there something they can do um, sort of directly themselves or is this something that they need to work through your team? I think it's a good question also around friction. Um, yeah. So yeah. Mirana, I'm guessing it's pretty easy for your customers, right? Uh, there's probably an unsubscribe button or do they go through yes. your team? Yeah. No, they, they just need to click on unsubscribe though. We take them through a very detailed exit survey as we mm. cannot really control, prevent them from clicking on and subscribing, but we can try to force them to give us as much information as possible. So then we could either reach back to them um, or try to get a better understanding of return as well. It's very important for us since they can do that without reaching out. Yeah. Uh, and we also, since some might churn, I mean, for us in our business, some might churn just because it was a temporary campaign and we do want them to come back. 
So we do have uh, something automated where we ask them if they would like us to uh, reach out to them in three months, uh, in which case if they say yes, and we have uh, an email that will be sent out three months later with all the recent features that we updated, um, try offering them another uh, trial extension as well. So they could test Lumni again and then uh, subscribe back our we have a lot of reactivation campaigns, actually very important for our revenue overall. Uh, since it's so easy, we need to make it easy also for them to come back. So this is something we're heavily working on. Yeah. You want to leave the relationship open, right? The door open. Yes. Yeah. Travis, what are, what are your thoughts on sort of handling these goodbyes with customers um, and, and how to process that? Yeah, for me, I, you know, I, I tend to want to talk to customers myself personally. And so usually it's just a, a personal email. Um, you know, I, I find that, you know, flows where you're, you're forcing information, they're going to fill out whatever they need to do to hit the minimum requirement, hit submit. So um, I, I usually just, you know, personal email. Thank you for being a, a customer. If there's anything we can do to help in the future, let me know. Is there any feedback that I can get to improve our product? Yeah. And, and how often are people responding to that um, sort of personal email? I suspect, I mean, it's not all the time, but I would suspect 50 to 75% of the time um, yeah. it's something. It may not be great, but you, know, you usually get uh, some sort of response. Yeah. Yeah. Marana, what's the response rate on your uh, post-cancellation survey? So once we receive them, actually, the once they submit it, the... CS team received them and they reach out with personalized emails. I wouldn't say since we we do receive a lot, <laughs> not that we have a high churn, but we have a lot of customers. So I would say, um, no, it wouldn't be 75 or 65 far from that. I would say maybe 20% and still, I would be very happy if it was really a full 20. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, all right, closing comments, because we're coming up to um, the, the final few minutes um, here. But I'm wondering, Parker, Maria, anything else you want to add to handling that goodbye process with customers? I think from, from my perspective, we always, always try to have a conversation with them. I mean, we are in a privileged position where, you know, Leggy is a pretty sticky product, but Whenever we find that, you know, customers sometimes do leave us, we always try to offer value, like Parker was saying, until the very end, including facilitating the migration out of Leggy mm. um, so that they actually take the call and then we can show them how to take their uh, information out. So that's why they take the call. And then we also use that time to understand, is there something that we could have done differently or is there a feature that they're missing? Why is it that they decided to leave us when they don't need or, you know, help to export their information and they really don't want to take that call, then we make it as easy as possible so that they can just answer an email and be like, Hey, this is the reason why. Um, but yeah, we, we even take these interviews with um, customers that are, you know, in our lowest paying tier. So that's the one place where, we don't make distinctions. We really want to talk with each and every customer that doesn't find the necessary value in our product to understand what is it that we could be doing better at any point in the company, like whatever it is. Yeah. And we just had a comment from um, Mads in the chat who asked about, you know, how do you differentiate between giving someone a call or not when they churn? Um, and I, I think I'm hearing from you the answer is, we don't. Uh, we, we don't. Try as much as possible to, to talk to all of them and see what we can gain, um, which is wonderful. I mean, I so un unfortunately we're sort of at the end of our time for today. But as a non-customer success uh, person, I think I'm taking away a couple of key points here. So first off, you know this downturn, recession, whatever word it's going to be used and uh, published when and when when things uh, progress is different from what happened two years ago. Um, it's different in ways we're not sure of yet, um, but we certainly know that it's something that's going to affect people perhaps a little bit more broadly than what we experienced two years ago. Secondly, I'm taking away the concept that discounts, uh, multi-year plans, uh, giving people extensions, making it easier for your customers to stay customers is all about getting something in return. 
So whether it's an understanding of how you can keep delivering value to them, an understanding of them being long-term customers, or an understanding of it being a short-term discount, that so long as there's a reciprocal relationship there, it's always going to be positive. And then the last one, a cheap and easy one for me, is when people churn, give them a call, give them an email, ask a survey. Once again, there's a reason why people are leaving, and you know it's absolutely fine to ask. Worst they can say is, send you maybe an angry email, I guess. <laughs> but in any case, that's also Intel itself, isn't it? Um, with that, I want to uh, wrap up today's uh, panel. Thank you so much, Maria, Parker, Travis, and Mariana. Uh, really, really insightful discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, everyone who joined, you'll be receiving a recording of this panel later today. And we'll also share our top highlights from this discussion on the chart mogul blog and in our SAS roundup newsletter uh, later this month or next month. Um, we will be coming together one more time this year um, in this series on the 7th of December with another expert panel to discuss a big one for SAS leaders here, which is how are we going to develop stronger strategies to drive growth in 2023 and really around strategy development, something that I'm definitely pretty focused on right now and I'm sure the rest of our panel is as well. Um, for now, thank you, everyone, and we hope to see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye.